Hey, howdy, everybody, and welcome back to Second Cup. I am your host, Tim Heller. Today's guest is Daron Feldman. Daron is an Israeli-American director and writer, having directed network television shows, films, documentaries, animated series, commercials, and music videos that have garnered more than 17 million views across all platforms. A couple of quick things I wanted to address before we jump into this conversation with Daron. In this conversation, you'll hear me address him as Drew, not Daron, because I knew him as Drew before he started going by Daron and he has allowed me to keep calling him Drew. Now, if you meet Daron out in the wild, he will ask that you go by Daron. So please keep that in mind if you meet him. Now, top off your beverage, get comfy, and enjoy this episode of Second Cup with Daron Feldman. Oh boy, here we go. Drew, I am so happy to see your face. It has been, once again, for the second or fourth time, Far too long since we've been able to reconnect and talk. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm just happy to be here. Thank you so much for making time to come back on the show and 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 chat and and just I don't know and just share who you are with with everybody who's listening. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, doing a round two here. Yeah, of course. So for uh, our listeners, um, can you just share a little bit about who you are, what you're doing now? And, and then we'll jump into all the fun stuff uh, after that. Sure. Yeah. So my name's is Daron. Um, who am I? Uh, I currently live in Pittsburgh. And um, I am a film director, writer, and producer. Uh, that's what I do full time. On the side, I have uh, an investing finance hobby. Uh, so that's what I do when I'm not. And I, you know, and also uh, a, um, uh, like a forest study philosophy, you know, uh, hobby as well. So those are kind of the main things. Um, but the primary thing is I'm a husband. So I'm just trying to be a good partner in a relationship. That's number one. Uh, and working myself and trying to be better. So I don't know, I'm a combination of all those things, I guess. Yep. All of this in one beautiful human. And a friend and a friend. Um, friend to you, hopefully. A, a, friend. a decent friend to you, yes. hopefully. I'll, I would say well well past the decent point. Um <laughs> But by the way, I have to say, so, you're in Austin, right? Yes. Yeah. So we, I was supposed to be in Dallas for a couple of months coming up. And I was going to take a trip with Danielle, with my wife. And I, I wanted to come take a trip to see you. We're now no longer going to be in Dallas. Um, no. I know. We may come in for a week, but I don't think that will warrant a, a drive to Austin. Um, so unfortunately you were, you were on my list, like you were at the top of the list to, to drive out to, it makes it, it you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I could still be convinced to, to drag her to, to Dallas and then drive to Austin. But, um, but you were on the list. I, I was going to, I was actually going to tell you actually. and reach out to you because I, we were supposed to be in Dallas already uh, last Sunday. I was supposed to be there. And, um, I was there last Monday and Tuesday. Oh, really? For a video shoot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> when I just missed you. Yeah. Because we haven't, sailing we can, because we haven't met in person yet. That's what's so funny. I know, that's the wild thing. And so I was, I was actually going to jump into that. This perfect segue is that like we know each other, just since, pretty much since like right before COVID. Yeah. I think was when you were developing that docu series, and um, we know each other. Thank you to Alexander Zito, Zito in Nashville or wherever you are. Thank you for introducing us. Um, and it's another instance of these of really wonderful friendships developing through COVID and remote communication and interaction. And it's, uh, I'm going to this uh, voiceover conference in Atlanta at the end of March. And it's the, it's going to be the first time that I've met 99.9% of my close, like work friends and friends from online in person, which is like, I'm I'm like buzzing with excitement and also like kind of want to shit my pants. Yes, because you're like, nervous. Oh, what do I do with my hands? What do I do with my hand? Like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna... <laughs> but that's yeah, awesome. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about? I I, I love your journey from uh, acting school to where you are now, and I know there's a lot that's happened in between there. But if we can just kind of chew on a couple of those main. Uh, touchstones that have have gotten you where you are now. I feel like it's such a valuable story for people to hear, especially those who are uh, earlier on in their journeys in their careers, or I mean, really at any point with people who are looking to pivot or or pursue their dream portion of whatever industry they're in. Yeah, so I mean, it's a big a big topic. Um, I did I did start out as an actor, 
I went to Oklahoma City University for BFA in acting. I also studied at a place called the National Theater Institute, which is at the Eugene Little Theater Center in Connecticut. Uh, and I would say there, while I was at NTI, I started um, thinking about other things outside of acting and just sort of exploring uh, who I was as a total artist, as opposed to what I felt was a sort of technician in terms of acting. I mean, acting is obviously artistry, but where I was in school, we were given a lot of techniques. So I felt like a technician in that regard. And and I think um, and I think when I when I went over to NTI and I explored writing and producing and design and directing and that kind of opened me up to new possibilities and new opportunities. Uh, when I graduated from my uh, from university, I started directing. Um, well, the first thing I did was I did a tour with the Shakespeare Company for about a year. Um, and then mm -hmm. from there, after that, I moved out to Los Angeles. I started a theater company with my my friend and probably now still closest collaborator, Ty Fanning. And we started a theater company. Um, I was interested in that. Uh, I was interested in new work, devised work. I also liked classics as well. And so we put together a bluegrass folk production of Much Do About Nothing. I hired a composer from OCU to take Shakespeare's sonnets and write bluegrass music to it. We found actors in LA. A lot of the actors were people we went to school with who were, who were then out in LA. We rehearsed in Griffith Park. And is it Griffith or Griffin? It's been so long since, since I've been out there. I think it's Griffith. Griffith. Yeah, yeah. Griffith Park. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, and <laughs> because we want to pay for rehearsal space, we put on the show. It went really well. And that was, I had directed before, but that was really the first time I was directing outside of school and running a company and along with Ty. And then, um, and then it just sort of took off. And then while I was there, I mean, really what I'm doing, what I do now is I'm, I'm primarily in film and television. I, um, I've done a bit of theater. I'm happy to tell you about that. I most recently worked in Israel uh, right before COVID, a theater company, actually consulting for them now as they rebuild after COVID. Um, but I can, we, we, wow, we can get to that. But, but, you know, my, my yeah. work is really in um, film and television right now. And so um, how I got there was I had a friend named Caleb Wall. And Caleb also went to Oklahoma, moved out to LA. He had, he had, we well, worked on August Osage when that was in Oklahoma, and then he just moved to LA and started going at it. And um, I had an idea while I was touring with the Shakespeare Company for an adaptation of Julius Caesar that I wanted to make into a short film, um, sort of put it in a world of hacker uh, activists, hacktivists, which was super popular at the time, uh, and like anonymous, you know, like those things. So um, mm -hmm. Edward Snowden and all of that going on. Yeah. So I I um approached him and he thought well you know you know how to work with actors and i know how to you know put this whole thing together and so we teamed up and i did my first short film and oh i lost you here um oh no i lost you visually it's okay um can you going can you still <laughs> hear me okay yeah 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 uh, yeah. yeah just pick it up with um i don't know why you can't see me right now um julius did you lose me you can just shoot me a text <clears throat> I, I can see you um, i mean I can, yeah. I can hear you i can't see you okay cool um yeah just uh continue on uh yeah so anyway I'll, so so we'll go on so yeah. i so basically i i did my first short film and i was totally hooked and i i loved it i loved the entire process behind it and then from there we i, I got asked to do another shakespeare short film and i taught myself how to edit and we got into festivals and just sort of one thing led to the next so i found myself directing music videos and promotional content and all of a sudden i was a filmmaker and i no longer was really doing that much in theater um the my, the my transition really solidified went into directing from acting when i received a drama league directing fellowship which was a really amazing opportunity for me so that fellowship, for me, it was a stamp of approval that said, okay, you don't have to be an actor anymore. It's okay that that was your identity. It's okay that you can like let go of that identity and you can move into this other space. And so I think with that, I sort of said, okay, let's do it. I think you've had a similar journey yourself, you know, from acting into, yeah. into voiceover work and, you know, what you're doing now. Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting like fork in the road to navigate, right? And and at least for me, I'll speak for myself and I'd love to hear your perspective on how you navigated it because it is, at least for me, like since I was four years old, I knew I wanted to be an actor. And I was, I had set, you know, 
there were certain periods in time where like I was like, well, maybe I won't, maybe I'll, you know, be a doctor or whatever. But ultimately it was, it's been that track since I was a very little kid. And when that was all kind of taken away from me physically for, with my back issues that I used to have, then that pivot was like, okay, well, I guess I can't do that now. What are we going to do to stay involved and, and still like scratch that itch of, of needing to act? But how, how did you, how did you feel then? And how do you feel now about that decision to, to pivot and, and, and take that chance and go in another direction? <laughs> Danielle and I were watching the Wrexham documentary on Hulu uh, uh, with uh, Ryan yes. Reynolds, and I never remember the other guy's name, but that's part of the joke of the, uh, the show. Rob McElhenney. Rob McElhenney, <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. And um, we were watching when they're, they're kind of third partner, the, the writer, again, I don't remember his name, a British guy. Um, um, he was doing an audition for Obi Wan. And he was walking, yes. you know that part? He's walking in front of the camera, like it's back so and forth. And Danielle looked over to me and she was like, I'm glad I didn't know you at this stage in your life. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like yeah, thanks. I was like, that's that literally what we did. Watch him walk, you know, like just walking over. Like it was so, it was very funny. Yeah, savage. Um, 30 points for Danielle. Yeah, for she, sure. She wins. Sure. That is brutal. Br brutal. <laughs> brutal. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, in high school, there's only so many things you can do. And, and before that, obviously, I was acting too. And so I think when I looked at the options, that made the most sense. But when you get older and you realize there's a lot more, there's a lot more out there to explore. There are other interests. There are other opportunities. And it's a wider field uh, of play then I, I think yeah. for me, I found that I, I fit more naturally into other roles than acting. I, I would still maybe go back and, and act again if, if, if it made sense. Dabble a bit. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes I miss it. You know, I, I more, more, I don't really miss film acting, to be honest. I do miss the camaraderie and the high of going on stage and like having a performance and just like once it's moving, like you're moving with it and it's just going there's something about that, all that energy behind it that I do miss that part of it. I don't know if I really miss the work of an actor as much as I miss whatever that energy is and that sort of adrenaline that you get from, from going out. Um, so I, so other than that, I don't really have much of a desire. And, and I, I like in terms of directing and producing, I like that you sort of thinking big picture, thinking start to finish. It's, it's an entire complete yeah. process. Um, which is also true of the actor's work. I'm not dim you know, diminishing the actor's work by any means or any stretch of the imagination, but um, I, I just find it more intellectually stimulating. Yeah. Do you feel like it's unlocked, um, like looking at the big picture stuff, do you feel like that's unlocked a more entrepreneurial side of you or have you always felt kind of entrepreneurial? For sure. For sure. Um, I think I... What I've always been entrepreneurial, I've definitely become more, you know, more so in the past five years, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the work that I'm doing now, you know, 80% of the year is not directing. 80% of the year is developing scripts, optioning books, going out to producers and pitching. It's like everything that you do to build start going meeting with investors, meeting with other I mean, it is, it is you get a sliver of directing if you're lucky every year, you know, and then all this other work, but I love all the other work too, right? Like I'm constantly, I'm looking yeah. at, I can't say what they are, but I, I have two books right now I'm going after um, that are really, really amazing books, you know, and just like, going, oh, I, I, I like this thing over here. I find that book. I'm going to go out and I'm going to option it. And I'm going to go flip it and adapt it to the series. There's, there's something about that energy and that kind of thinking about it that that's really is interesting and exciting. And then when it works, it's even better. Um, you know, like, yeah. that's a whole different high of like, totally. it's like, Oh, not only is this validation, but there's also like a sustainable like paycheck and lifestyle yeah. that I can build upon this to support a family. What the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> there's also, you know what I would actually equate to the high in acting. Uh, so I'm working on rewrites on one of my projects. I, I, have, I have a couple main projects. Happy to tell you what they are You know, about. One of them is a Gilded Age movie yeah. called Wolf and Fox Hunt, which is about these reproduction copies. I think I've talked to you about it before. And yeah, share it, share with our listeners about it. Cause it's really, really cool. The whole concept of it and yeah. the story behind it. Yeah. So, so, um, I'll, I'll give you the backstory. The backstory is that, um, I found this script out of about a thousand log lines that I read and I optioned it from a writer named Glenn Hosking, who's a super talented writer. And we spent the last, 
um, well, it's been since now June. So we developed it for a couple of months. Then I started taking it out. Um, we're lucky to have Charlie Barnett, who is in Russian Doll. He was the co-lead in Russian Doll. And also I think he's doing the new Acolyte series coming out. He's attached to be a part of it. Yuri Sardarov. Thank you. Yuri Sardarov is an amazing, amazing actor. Um, he is also attached to be a part of it. He was on Chicago Fire for like seven or eight seasons. Um, and so we're starting to build up cast. Um, and, uh, we have some other, other, other attachments I can't speak about in public yet, but like, you know, part of that, and also going out with that story, right. That's another part of the producing is getting these attachments to the project. Like it, that is, it, it, it's building out the entire piece, right. It's not, but anyway, I was going to say so it's building your value prop for this, for this comp for the company that is the movie or yeah. the product that is the movie. Yeah. And I'm going on, I'm associating off a little bit, but to come back to what I was trying to say, um, which is that one of the highs is actually unlocking scripts. So for instance, I just spent a number of months doing working with Glenn and um, we took a bit of a break, we started going out and then I had some impulses uh, and also friends giving me some notes on the script. When we went back in, I mean, we spent like three weeks on this latest rewrite, just banging heads against the wall, exploring every avenue. And two or three days ago, it finally cracked open. Like it was just like, and, and when it did, it was the best feeling in the world because I, I literally felt like I was just beating my head against a wall, trying to come up with some kind of space or understanding of where the script needed to go. And, and sometimes it's just the last little bit of the script that's the hardest, right? We were like 95% there. And I felt, yeah, but there's still, you know, it's always evolving. It'll keep shifting. But I felt like there was a 5% gap that I needed to close and mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't coming. And, and so like that moment when it opened up, that was a, that was a, an incredible feeling, <laughs> an incredible feeling, you know, like better than making money from it, better than getting cool attachments on the project, better than getting cool producers. Like, like that creative opening is outweighs all of those things. It's all worth it for like the five seconds of that. Yeah, it's that my brother and I accident. I, I have a lot to catch you up on out, offline. Um, but my brother and I accidentally started a marketing company <laughs> like uh, like four or five weeks ago. And right now we're working really closely with the CEO of a startup in in Dallas who um, we are like on calls with him every day. And we're, the only thing we're trying to figure out right now is what is this? core mission it's two sentences we know it is we know what the company does how do we distill it down to two sentences and each time that we talk we get like an inch closer and we have like a meter to go and it's so it's just like we can you can smell it and then in that moment is going to be that payoff it's it is something different if people uh, the same thing not, same process it's it's solving puzzles it's it's mm -hmm. a giant puzzle uh and it's it's fun addictive try chat gpt um, it might it might it might spin some things out for you we've leveraged chat gpt <laughs> as well <laughs> did, it, did it help it's awesome did it frame it's, anything um, it 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 did all right for some things that we've used it for what i love it as a tool this will be a, a really short rabbit trail that we'll go down is i you know like i've created an ai version of my voice i am i'm very much in the in the camp of curiosity and uh, around AI and in the creative field and all of that, it's everything that it's doing. I do not think that it will ever fully replace humans. I think it'll replace those, the bottom, the the lower hanging fruit jobs. Like, I don't know, for, for voiceover stuff, it'll replace like IVR, like on hold messages and, and phone trees and stuff like that. And it's already starting to, right? But uh, I don't think that like in writing, I think it's going to provide it, or at least now it has provided some really excellent outlines or summaries of things. But what it is, the hardest thing to do is to program human nuance mm. into it because it, it's not going to do stuff that we can't, that we don't tell it to do. It'll continue to learn, but I don't know. It'll be interesting. What are your thoughts on that? I don't have any right now. Uh, yeah. Would you ever, would you ever uh, produce a movie written by AI? Just for shits and giggles. Sure, if it was good enough, why not? Could be interesting. Right? Yeah, why not? I guess that maybe that's all right. Let's do that. Yeah, I mean, I, we'll go I'm, out and I'm get not... a half a million dollar budget, yeah. and then we'll plug it in. Plug in. Does the, the AI get you, you the budget you too? Write us a ninety minute. Does the, yeah, does the AI get you the budget too? <laughs> it'll print. It'll print money for you. Yeah, yeah it's really yeah. it's wonderful. I've gotten a brand new truck, and it's I'm loving it. No repercussions so far. 
<laughs> Actually, it would be cool to use AI to sort of funnel money more easily in terms of like, oh, I'm I'm a person, I'm random, a random person in some city or state that wants access that would love to invest in a movie that's sort of, sort of like X or sort of like Y, and then yeah. you don't know them at all, they don't know you at all, you don't have to go to some website to find them, just some kind of connection point, you know. Someone make a lot of money on that. You can take that idea, whoever, whoever wants to. Yeah, done. I'll take it. It's money. Yeah, I mean, that's just like staying um, social network on steroids, right? It's just building out a network on steroids. Um, yeah. I mean, it probably already exists. I, I don't know much about the space. I, I'm sort of, you asked what I think. I'm afraid of it. So I think because I'm afraid of it, I, yeah. I have been avoiding looking into it too far. Yeah. What specifically are you afraid of about it? this is not a test by the way i'm not trying to like fucking roast you right now i'm just becoming I'm, slaves I'm to some ai robot machine i, I don't know <laughs> um you know everything that all the movies have yeah soon we'll be living in zion and exactly <laughs> fighting the machines and yeah yeah well okay so you touched a little bit on your um you know on your experience in uh, with with all of your with, with work work right and so with your investing stuff how do you find that hobby and because that's something oh. to me that like I I want to be so on it and I've got like a little investing project with some family members and and it's and it's here and there but it's mostly like okay well what are we passionate about what does the markets look like I'm not day trading I'm not like relying on it as a regular source of income but more of that that long game but what what drew you to it and pun intended and um and and what do you like about it like what is what about it feels fun like a hobby to you i think okay so i think psychologically why why it was interesting to me was because it was something that you could quantify whereas the business that i'm in feels like oftentimes never ending darkness and abyss and uncertainty <laughs> and, and the irony is that of course investing in the markets it's full of uncertainty it's not any more or less yeah. certain what i'm drawn to is uh, it's basically systematic investing or quantitative investing which is um usually backed by academic research um you got you know if people are interested they can look up companies like alpha architect aqr um Dimensional fund advisors, advances, these are all people that are using these sort of quantitative models to um, look at markets and stocks. I mean, if I, I'm a value investor inherently, so I'm looking for um, stocks that are uh, cheap relative to some fundamental aspect, you know, from fundamental aspect, and, and I want to buy them on a discount, right? It's no different than Warren Buffett. Um, but but now we have a lot of data behind us to, to look into it. So I think the, like, I like, I like, um, I like understanding what the different models are. I started learning statistics. I couldn't have cared less about that in school. Like, I think there's something about looking at the world through a, uh, that lens that's really interesting to me um, and also uh, comforting to me as well, um, especially given that I, I, think it's just, I think it's a good, you know, they say diversify your portfolio. I think it's, it's a good diversifier to my, to my, uh, my day job, so Artistic to speak. Artistic portfolio and yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like to me, to me emotionally as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you heard it here, kids. Join the arts. It's a never-ending dark void. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Well, I told you about the moment of life that we just had. You know, on the script. That's what you're. That's yeah, what you're holding on yeah. to. You know. The. The. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, investing is is also like that. It just it just feels like it it, it accesses a different part of my brain. But really, why did I get into it? Like, what's the genesis? Um, you, I came out of school with um, debt, with not understanding how to manage my money. So it really started with just how do I go into personal? It was personal finance, right? It's coaching. It's it's like yeah. dealing with myself. It's budgeting. I budget every single dollar that I have. I know where every single dollar is going in my budget mm. at all times, basically. I think I'm probably overdo it, right? And again, it's another way to balance out the sort of insanity and uncertainty of. Um, my work is that I have a budget that I can look at and control, you know, that I can know I can put yeah. in input and output. If I save money, I keep the money. Yeah. If I spend it, it goes away. It's very, very simple. At, you know, I can yeah. work for years on a project and, and it could turn into nothing. 
you know, and that's just sort of what you have to put up with. So I think, I think it started from there and then it moved into investing and then it just, it's sort of, you know, once you go down any rabbit hole, it continues and, um, and you're, oh, okay, there's these things called value momentum investing. There's all sorts of things, you know, ways to, to dive in. Um, I mean, I definitely found myself in a certain space of the investing world. I'm not a stock picker. I'm not a day trader. Um, I don't believe in discretionary active, you know, investing. I don't, that's not, that's not, um, what I couldn't tell you what that means. So I'm pretty sure I don't believe in it either. I, this is, yeah, <laughs> maybe to the extent that I've learned this is to the extent that I am in despair over how difficult the business is. Um, maybe it's a good parameter. Um, it, you know, I'm, I, I'm saying this, but I, I should say I'm also incredibly grateful for all the opportunities I have had in the business. And there are, for if if the light didn't out out shadow you know out out shadow has light light's not shadow the light didn't didn't outweigh the darkness I'm a, I'm there with you yeah. yeah if it didn't outweigh the darkness then I wouldn't be in the business and it, and it continues to yeah. do it and every time I'm like I have a uh, uh, running joke with my wife I'm like I'll just go become a financial advisor I'll just quit you know I'll just become a financial yeah. advisor and every time that happens it's like it's like no I can't do it yet. There's, I got to, I got to keep going. Something breaks through, you know, and it's maybe yeah. that, that for me is more of just like, a, you know, sort of like sucking your thumb as a kid, like a comfort piece, you know, just to be like, oh, I could, mm -hmm. I could do this other thing. I know deep down, I'm not, I, could, I know I deep down, I'm not if going really to. If I really wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, but, but again, a lot of things, thank God right now, things are going very well, you know, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very fortunate, you know, in that regard. Um, um, but it, ebb, it ebbs and flows I've gone through. I mean. I would say if you spoke to me, even the last time we spoke, or even between that, I would have been even more despair than I'm in now, <laughs> um, uh, which is actually very little despair. I, I'm, I'm being I'm being facetious. I'm, I'm not really in despair. Yeah. But yeah, um, gotcha. just to be clear, <laughs> just to be clear to the audience. But I, I like, um, but I, I I don't want to underemphasize the difficulty of the business because yeah. because it is difficult. Um, and... Yeah, it is. But it, I mean, again, and that's like we've said, it, it comes back to that equation of why we do it is because when it is so hard, that payoff is even sweeter. Those five seconds of, of figuring out the script, of getting the tagline, of nailing that audition, of whatever, whatever it is, it's the payoff is there and, and you find a way to make it worth it. And I absolutely empathize. And, and what you said about like, well, I could go do this other thing, but I'm not going to because I just got validation or I just got like, I'm, well, I'm choosing to be doing it, this or what. It's, it's not, it's not validation. real. It's, no, well, I, I was sort of joking that to say that it's from outside. It's, it's not, I, I, I couldn't do anything else. Um, yeah. I think they, the truth is deep down. I know that uh, like, I don't think I'm going to go become the best financial advisor or investor out there. I, I, I don't, I think I would be a decent one. Um, because of all the many other things that you have to do to be a financial advisor it has nothing to do with managing yeah. investments. Um, I, I think that this is not, this is not a, um, I, I think that I have strengths and certain personality traits that make directing and producing and, and writing um, something that, that I, I can really, I have been able to and can continue to excel in. These are not straight. These are not traits that I developed, right? I mean, maybe some things I've developed. I think they're just sort of, inherent in me we all have these different strengths and i just try to show up every single day and work as hard as i can at developing the strengths i have and hopefully bringing up the weaknesses a little bit too along the way yeah i love that so uh let's go to israel uh you yeah. mentioned that you spent some time there i know that in our past conversations uh, that i know that you've spent a, a more than a decent amount of time there yeah um tell me about that experience for you and and how did how did you end up there the first time and and how have we gotten to now consulting with this um israeli company on and do you say it was theater or for tv and film theater yeah yeah oh, i mean awesome. so so um i'm jewish i i live a, a more observant jewish life um and uh, and that really started for me the very first time i went to israel sort of being opened up to what it meant to be around the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. Um, and that was really inspiring to me. Um, and over the years, I just started learning more, studying more. So I ended up taking time off to go to Israel and live on the side of a mountain and essentially study Torah, study philosophy, Jewish ethics, um, metaphysics. And I did that for a couple of years um, and in Jerusalem. 
And then I ended up staying there for another year. I actually got citizenship there. I was planning to stay and live there um, and uh, build a, a career there. Um, but I, I still had contracts and jobs in the U.S. So I, right before COVID, I came back to the U.S. I mean, here's, here's how I got back to the U.S. I came back to the U.S. I took a job doing a, a documentary about Johnny Cash. It was an awesome project. And then COVID hit and the world shut down. And I didn't go back yeah. to Israel. And then I met my wife. And then we had a shotgun wedding. And now I live in the States. Now I live in Pittsburgh. So wild. Um, so, you know. <laughs> Everything went remarkably to plan. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so I, I love Israel. Right before I left, I did help open the very first English-speaking professional theater in Israel. It's called Center Stage Israel. There has been English community volunteer theater. There had never been paid professional theater. Um, so this was a, a, a couple um, out of from the, originally from South, South Africa. They moved to Israel. They had a big community. They started it uh, in a city a bit north of Tel Aviv, and it was great. It was wildly successful. I couldn't believe how many people were coming to these shows. I directed their first play, which was uh, we did uh, Bad Jews by Josh Harmon. It's a really fun, funny play. And then of course COVID hit, and unfortunately they had to shut down because they were just starting out. And it's hard enough to have a theater company, and especially in COVID, even harder. And now I'm consulting with them and helping them rebuild. Um, they're looking for a new space. They're sort of starting over, starting fresh, um, and taking what they've learned from, you know, the previous opening and applying it and also trying to um, – helping them develop their strategy in terms of thinking through, um, you know, on a business end, in terms of, okay, how do we make sure we can use your budget appropriately? Let's think three years out. Let's not just think six months out. You know, things that they're doing, but I'm just trying to be another um, a sounding board for them. So I'm consulting with them. And that's been great because because I love the theater. And I think once I stop trying to make a career out of the theater, which is, is so challenging, I think, um, mm -hmm. for many, many, many reasons, even though I love it, um, it, it just makes me excited to help them and to work with them in consulting and, and to be able to give a space of time that's really precious and interesting and not have to have it be something that returns capital, you know? Um, so, yeah. so that's been really interesting um, and, and good. Yes. Yeah, so that's a little bit about my time, my time in Israel. I don't know what else I can tell you. I mean, it's, it's great. I love it. I would, I, I would yeah, love to, I, mean, I would love to move back. I, hopefully we will, you know, sooner than later. Um, right now we're here in the States because of our careers and where that's taking us, but certainly the vision is to, to move back to, the sunny beaches of Tel Aviv and good weather and not the snow outside that we have in, you know, great Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, that definitely wouldn't suck. No, it wouldn't <laughs> suck at all. It wouldn't suck at all. Yeah. Is there anything you, and, uh, yeah. and, anything you want to know specifically about that? No, no. I mean, I know that we, we've we talked more extensively about about other parts of that journey for you uh, offline, and, and I want to keep that just between the two of us, but it's, um, I just think it's so cool and special, and I, and I think the reason why I wanted to ask about it is just because I think it's so admirable that you took a chance. You you discovered this portion of your yourself and your your family history and your faith and heritage uh, that that you felt called to go and and just be in it and to immerse yourself in it. And I don't feel like we hear a lot. At least I don't hear a lot. You know, I, of of people our age and in the creative arts that have that calling and decide to just listen and, and commit to it and follow. And I think it's just really special. And to see that it's how God has held you in, in your journey with this, with being in the theater and then in TV and film and being called to learn about your faith and all of this stuff. I just think it's really special. And I think it's a really unique perspective that you have and experience that you've had that's, that's carried you through your career and, and, and all of the exciting and beautiful things to come. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, you know, it, it's certainly, we, we have a, um, there, there's a Hebrew word called betachon, which means trust. And I like to say that the business gives me a master's degree in trust. That's what being in this industry is. Um, and, and for sure, without uh, a sort of bigger picture sense about our meaning and purpose in this world um, and what that, you know, um, and then, you know, connecting to God, um, dare, I, dare I say that, that word, which is so loaded, um, but, but maybe I'll, I'll call it, um, I think it says to you before, but I, I'd rather call it sort of spaceless, timeless 
isness, you know, uh, as opposed to God, which is like a white bearded man, which is not at all what it, it, it can mean. Um, so, you know, when, when I connect to that, that part, that higher self, whatever that, whatever that is, you can translate it to many different places that is definitely helps sustain and, you know, push forward in my career and my life and the choices I've made, um, and how I, how I build community around myself. It's, it's, it's been, it, it's filtered into every aspect of my life. And I, I'm so grateful for it. It's not that it's not hard. You know, anyone who tell you with a spiritual yeah. practice, if you're serious and dedicated to it, it's rigorous and it takes time. Um, but it is ultimately meaningful. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I, I, I'm, I, you're right. It was, I sort of had to wager, you know, things were going really well before I decided to go to Israel. I just had this drama league fellowship. There's also momentum in a career. When you have momentum, it's like, you want to keep going. And I sort of made a wager. I yeah. said, you know, I, I think that for my entire life, taking off this time is probably more beneficial for me as a human being, you know, from here until hopefully 120 years old than, you know, than putting another two years into my career. And I had to make a bet. My bet was, you know, I think if I go away for two years, it'll still be here when I get back. And, uh, and, and sure enough, it's still here. <laughs> it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um and uh, and I think I hopefully I'm better for it and also hopefully a better artist, too. And um, because I I do think that all art is really just like like the, I, I, it seems to me that um, accessing true originality comes via humility and removing your ego, mm. uh, of which I have a large one and I'm constantly trying to work on. Um, <laughs> and true. Um, and I also think that um, yeah, I won't say this. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's I think that's true, and I, yeah, I think that's true. I I think connecting yourself to a bigger picture certainly helps you to become a better collaborator as well. Something outside I agree. yourself. I agree, and it's there is no need, at least from from the two of us, to for that bigger picture or bigger being to be the same thing that you believe in, I believe in whatever it is. It's, it, I think the important part, especially well, I, like, you know, being a, an addict, you know, and, and having, having family members, having uh, gone through AA, you know, that first, the first, one of the first steps is surrendering to your higher power and, and saying that you have, you know, that you have to surrender. It's not the first step and people in the program are going to roast me, but it's whatever it's, but it is something that I have found <laughs> that just having a higher power, whether that's God for you, the universe, whatever, however you connect is, it's almost the easier choice. It's the easier choice in some ways. And and then you bring in that rigorous aspect of practice and, and, and curiosity and, and all of that, and it becomes more difficult, but yeah. Uh, before it, I, I, I would, I don't, I, I, I can I say, it? Oh, sorry. Go, ahead. go for it. Yeah. No, no, no. Go for it. No, I was just, I just want to, I just want to say, I don't think it's easier. Um, I think there are trade-offs, right? So, so yeah. I think that um, in some ways it's easier when you start, um, giving over to what's called a higher power. It, Jewish word is Hashem, which means like just the name. We just say the name. It's a you know, way to sort of describe without describing. Uh, yeah, there there are things that are easier and there are things that are more challenging. So I just think it's a, a, a trade off either way. Um, I, For sure. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the way my, I see it is my, easier, my take, at least my take from, on it. Yeah. The way that I, that, that I didn't mean to like to, to reduce the, the practice of, of faith and, and devout religion yeah. uh to to being easier or hard but i think the what i what i in, intended and what what i meant is like i feel like f for me personally and it was it's been in the times where i've been really struggling and feeling like i i don't have direction when i can turn to a higher power in my mind it's like how like i i feel i feel this weight that's lifted off of me instead of having to bear that burden just as my my mere mortal self and carry it and and drag it or and try to get it through so that's that's where the the easy the the poor word choice the poor vernacular of the village idiot over here in austin texas uh that's where it spawned from no i no i think i i think that's one of the benefits right right there's trade-offs that certainly and i to me that benefit is worth its weight in gold so i, I i'm with you uh, I, I hear what you mean by the word easier in that regard in that situation, yeah, I think there is something, um, but it's also it's also not easy to let go. So, so maybe it's yeah. easy. Meaning, yeah. it, it sounds like you've just trained yourself to be able to go to that spot, but there's there's probably some time before that it's where letting go was much harder 
that you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a painful part of my personality for a lot of people too. Is like, God, why are you so positive? What the hell is your deal? <laughs> and so I think it's, I think it's my natural like rose colored glasses that I'm like, oh well, that wasn't so bad. It's like, well, because uh, yeah. you know, it was meant to happen, and which I also accept is also a big part of me having the privilege that I have as I move through the world. So, but yeah. So before yeah. I forget though, before we uh, get to, I have. I want to know where people can find you, what you got going on, all of that stuff. And then we've got some quick fire questions for you. Um, I wanted to address okay, too, cool. just in case any of the listeners are curious, I've been addressing you as Drew. I've known you as Drew. Uh, you introduced yourself as Daron. Um, would you mind just sharing mm -hmm. like why that is? And, and um, I promise that I'm to all my listeners, I'm not just being an asshole to, <laughs> to Drew by not. Calling oh yeah. Yeah. Daron. No, no, no. It's good. So, so so, you know, in Judaism, oftentimes in America, you, you'll, you'll get a Hebrew name, you'll get your English name, right? So my, my English name is Drew. That's what I went by. But I always, when I was called up to read the Torah, when, you're, when you have a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, you're called by your Hebrew name. And so um, we believe that the, the Hebrew name is deeply attached to a person's essence. And so when you're called that, your sort of essence is being called out. So my Hebrew name is, if I was Israeli, I would say Doron. And so my Hebrew name is, uh, or if I tell people uh, in, in America, I say door own, just put door and own together, door own. Um, in Texas, it's Doran. So Dor no, it's not. Dor it's Doran. Yeah, I get Doran, 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 Doran all right? Or, uh, or Doran. Um, so, yeah, and what's funny, actually, is uh, one of my, one of my um, another close collaborator writing partner, his name is Derek Weisbein. I hope he's okay with me saying this. His Hebrew name we discovered after we'd already met is also Daron. So our joke is that if we ever start a production company, it will just be Daron Daron. <laughs> you know, his name is Derek and I'm Drew. Um, but anyway, you, you also, you get, oftentimes you'll get these Hebrew names uh, after someone who's passed away. So I was named after my grandmother, Doris, hence where we get Daron and you put the D and the Drew and the Doris and all of a sudden it all kind of comes together. Um, but I, I decided I wanted to start going by it because I felt like, um, I don't know, I just felt like it expressed something in me that that I wanted to share. I don't know if it, there's anything deeper than that. I like the name. Um, and so my, my general rule is anyone can call me Jerome. Uh, but if people knew me as Drew, I, I, you know, say you can keep calling me Drew because that's how you know, that's how you know me. And so there's no reason to shift that relationship. But when I meet new people, I introduce myself as Jerome. Uh, my wife calls me Drew, so it just happens to be that or everyone's constantly confused, which I think is okay. <laughs> um, at least it makes them think twice, Here's you know, about, about who you are. I'm Drew's wife. <laughs> you're, you're, oh, no. Did, did it again? It cut out. Oh, man. That's the poor payoff. Oh, Julius, it, let's it, cut that out. It, no, it, I'm just uh, kidding. I said, here's the plot twist. It, I'm Drew's wife. <laughs> I'm Drew's wife. I'm so confused because I'm calling you Daron, or I, because I'm calling you Drew still. And you said, "Well, like my wife oh, is one of the few oh, people." Oh, that oh, oh, sorry. Well, it's I'm bad. sorry. No, we're gonna cut joke. that. No, Julius, I, uh, make sure this yeah. makes it to the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> cut your floor. Get out of there. Like, cut. Oh, I've got him yeah. there. God damn it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no, you're no, no. You, you, you're, you're allowed to call me. You're allowed, and I, people will have a hard time pronouncing it. Fine, they call me anyway. My name means my name means gift. I, I I like it, so I so I started going by it, and um and it fits. And and um, that's funny. I had someone just this past weekend say Daron, and I I turned immediately, and she was like, oh, I didn't think you were gonna like respond so quickly, because you know, <laughs> oh, I'm like, because you didn't think I'm used to that name. I'm like, no, I actually like respond to that name now. Like that's that it is my name. I mean, it was always my name, and now it's really my name. Yeah. In in the sense that I'm using yeah. it. So. Oh yeah, that, that's why I'm going. It's why I'm going by Jerome. Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that and dealing with my awful joke as the internet cut <laughs> in and out. Uh, for yeah, those no of you problem. who are listening to the podcast not live, uh, I I had a, a joke that I freaking nailed. Drew was on the floor in stitches, just laughing his ass off. Um, not the case. Okay, so where can where can people find you and and what do you have going on that that we can get the word out about? Yeah, you can find me at my website, um, DeroneDrewFeldman.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, too. I think it's Derone D. Feldman on Instagram. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Um, and uh, although I mainly use Twitter to, to follow FinTwit, 
financial Twitter. So, so I don't really post anything. I just sort of, I just sort of read, like just follow all the people I want and only them. So I can just get their, get their content. Um, so, so I am in, I am in that space in my spare time. Um, and, uh, yeah, what am I working on? So one project is this Gilded Age piece called Wolf and Fox Hunt. Uh, it's a period piece. Uh, it's about reproduction copyists in the Gilded Age. Really excited about it. And we're putting that project together right now. Hopefully it'll be put together and we'll be able to start, you know, moving into production very soon. Um, the other thing I'm working on is a book called Like Dreamers. And that is written, was written by Jesse Klanalevi, who's a New York Times bestselling author for a book called Letters from Palestinian Neighbors. And Like Dreamers won the Jewish Book Award. It's an incredible epic about modern Israel. And it follows seven paratroopers who, uh, from 1967 up until the early 2000s, who basically went on in their lives to do radically different things. Um, they were ideologically divergent. Uh, and the careers, they were divergent um, in every way. One was one of these paratroopers was a, a socialist, started as a socialist. He ended up becoming a major capitalist thinker and figure in Israel and uh, was behind the unilateral withdrawal of Gaza. And I think it was 2005. Another one became a leading religious Zionist figure. Another one started helped start the Peace Now movement, which was against the religious Zionists. So if you want to learn about modern Israel, Israel and like the fabric of the people, it is their amazing personal stories. Another one is about Mayor Ariel, who is like the Bob Dylan of Israel. So it follows each of these paratroopers. So we're basically we're adapting this into a television show and a podcast, um, like a fiction podcast. I'm working with a company called wow. Crystal City Entertainment um, to to work on the podcast right now. Um, so we're doing a podcast first and taking it out for television. Um, it's it's just an amazing story. It's, if people ask, it's Band of Brothers meets The Crown. It's like the best way I can describe wow. the feeling of it. Um, so it's an epic book. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm so fortunate to have uh, uh, been able to get the rights to it, you know, in the first place. And we'll see. We're taking some other calls, and we'll see where that project uh, goes next. And then, um, as I said, I have a couple of books I'm I'm working on. Uh, optioning as well and then adapting those into one one would probably be a film one would be a television show um so i'm i'm um we're doing projects uh all kinds of different things oh, those are sort of the, the, uh, the big ones pivot pal oh yeah pivot pals it, it's it, because it's sort of I done remember. i haven't been thinking about it so we yeah. we yeah, yeah we had a we had a we had a world premiere in new york city uh at the regal and union square in December with Dances with Films, which is an unbelievable film festival. And then just also screened like two weeks ago in Palm Beach at the Palm Beach International Film Festival. Pimp Pal is a short mm-hmm. film I made. Um, when it, thank you. When it's done, it's it's festival run. We'll probably just release it online for the public. Um, you are a star of Pivot Pals. Um, <laughs> won't spoil it for, for who you are, people. No, really, it's like, it really is like, you're, you're, you book it, man, like you're in it. Um, and, um, and, and it's great. I'm so fortunate to have you in it. It's, it's just awesome. And, and everyone that I, I, well, I don't want to give it away because hint, he's playing a podcast host. Um, oh, <laughs> just like you are what now. A stretch. Um, <laughs> what a stretch. I don't think you actually had a podcast at the time. I think, I think I that you didn't have one yet. And I think that maybe I it's, didn't. maybe this whole podcast is because of, of me. Maybe I'm responsible for this. <laughs> Wow, I, maybe you should rename the podcast oh after God, me, Daron. Just call it Gift. Yeah, <laughs> the Gift podcast with Tim. The okay, gift. you can take the name. And it's just your headshot <laughs> that you sent in on the submission. Yeah, form. yeah just, just my headshot, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So I want credit for you starting your podcast. What? Because I gave, I, I, I basically. I showed you that you could do it, you know, anyway. Um, but truly you have a podcast voice. And I remember when I, when I played it for people, they're like, is this a real pod? Like, is this a real podcast? Is this a real person? And I was like, no, I mean, yes. And yes, now it is. Neither. Well, now it is a real podcast. But at the time it was like, no, it was just incredible talent that came in and, and nailed it. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so yeah, we did that. Um, we were still waiting to hear back from other festivals. Hopefully we'll hear, some good news coming up. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited. That was a really a great film. We we shot it in Pittsburgh a year ago, and um, literally a year ago. And uh, I just when I moved here, I was like, this this city is so so cool, so interesting. It's very scenic, and I just wanted to make a movie here. So we made it, and I'm really proud of it. 
as you should be. It is. It's a very sweet film, and it's beautiful Thank too, you. Uh, visually and and story wise. I have to shout out my writing partner and producer Derek Weisplein, who also was a co writer and creator of that as well. So I I can't yes. can't go without uh, shouting him out. Okay, Rapid Fire. Future member of Daron Daron. Yeah, Rapid Fire. Let's. Um. Okay. I can't get over Daron Daron. That's know, so good. I know. I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's a nickname you had as a kid? Uh, oh, I told you this before. Okay. I know. And I I'm shouting it out for Becca Cooper stock. If you're listening, Becca, this is for you. <laughs> My nickname as a kid was Mr. Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, until I looked at my my note sheet. I had forgotten that that was your answer until I saw nickname, and it was just this like full body experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can you, Who in, you can uh, use that clip from you can use that clip from the last recording when I first told you. Yeah, 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 um, perfect. Y- yeah, um, Mr. Sexy, and, and I was named that not you know obviously because I I needed a little help in that regard, so I thought the name could uh could support support my endeavors um yeah that was my nickname that's amazing uh who inspires you right now Mm. i'm I'm a different answer than before my wife inspires me um Mm. she she really does her uh i'm I'm gonna call her out a little bit and, and say that this is a person who admittedly told me when we first started dating, I don't really have a lot of patience. It's not one of my strengths. And to and it was something she wanted to work on. And if you met her now, you would have no idea that that mm-hmm. she had any ever any sort of um, weakness in that area. It is like a total strength. And I've been so inspired by that lately. And just her ability to like roll the punches and have grit and you know, it's so many things that I need to build my own life. And so I look at her and I'm like, I got to be more like you, you know, so I, I really am. I'm really quite inspired by her. Wow. I love that. Uh, what's a piece of content that you're consuming right now it can be a book, a uh, TV show, podcast, something you can't get enough of that. You're just like, I gotta, I gotta get more of this. Can't wait to jump back in. Mm. I'll tell you what I can't, what I can't wait to jump back into is Ted Lasso. Yes. I'm not oh, currently yeah. consuming it, but I'm just waiting until March to get back into We're two it. Two weeks out, baby. Yeah. Two weeks yeah. out. He's Ted is not. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that. I would say just to say, I, I'd say book wise, um, uh, I, I'll just be nerdy about it. I just read a book called Quantitative Momentum, which is about momentum investing, and it's super geeky, mm-hmm. and I loved it. So, so I'm going to throw that out there too. Amazing. Um, yeah. Sweet quantitative momentum and ted lasso uh all right last question you can only have pizza one last time where from and what's on it and if you have any um uh, allergic reactions to food (laughs) they don't happen with this magic pizza it is just pure bliss so actually um i just went to a place in pittsburgh called the edge which is in carnegie mellon's campus and it was Mm. and i it was so i keep a kosher diet so uh i just primarily eat at kosher restaurants and usually the pizza at kosher restaurants is like, man, it's okay, it's not whatever. We went to this, we went to this restaurant in Carnegie Mellon like in, in the campus. It's really good pizza, like, like actually, like really, really, really good pizza. I was sitting there and I was like, I cannot believe how good this pizza is. Like as good as anything you get in New York. It was totally shocking. Um, Damn. Okay. Yeah, I was like, I like, and I would like if you ask me like if where would I go get great pizza? Like that would be easily top three. So we just had it and I was like blown away. So I'm just saying edge Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, you know, enjoy. Um, what kind of pizza? Uh, I'm sort of basic. I, I mean, so I don't eat pepperoni. I'll tell you the truth. It'd be pepperoni pizza, but the truth is I don't eat pork yeah. anymore. So, 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 yeah. so, 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 it's, so, so, so there's no dietary or faith-based consequences to consuming this hypothetical pizza. Yeah. Please. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, yeah. Pepperoni pizza, like for sure. 100%. Um, all the way. Oh yeah. You know, maybe throw some like spinach on there to feel a little healthy or something, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, you gotta grease the pipes a little bit. <laughs> 
Well, Mr. Sexy, thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs> no, seriously, Drew Drone, thank you so much for for making the time to do this, and uh, it's always so good to see you. And I and I will be more intentional about scheduling some more time off air for us to to reconnect and, and dive in on, on great. Everything I'm so I'm so excited for you. Excited to hear about your your new business too, connecting offline. Um, yeah, thanks for having yeah. me. This has been fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Second Cup with my good friend, Darone Feldman. If you'd like to keep up with what he's doing, you can follow him on Instagram at Darth Drewish and also check out his website, www.daronedrewfeldman.com. Huge shout out to the Second Cup family, Arvith Bercy, Sarang Sharma, Tara Seuss, and Julia Shepard Morgan for without whom this episode would not have happened. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on any and all platforms that you consume Second Cup on so you can stay up to date on all of the amazing new conversations and catch up on some of the old ones. Tune in next time for another amazing conversation with a really cool person. Bye!